Hey guys, what's up? It's the Culture Detective here investigating your favorite movies. And today I'm going to be doing a movie review on a movie that I have finally watched last night. Riri Shushu no Subete, or All About Lily Shushu, written and directed by E.Y. Shunji, a film from the year 2001 in Japan. So, um, this is a film that I've been trying to watch and wanting to watch for an extremely long time. Because, um, about a year ago, I reviewed the album To See the Next Part of the Dream by Paranol. And someone in the comments section was like, Yo, check out this movie all about Didi Shushu. Because apparently, um, all about Didi Shushu is one of the biggest influences for the album. And this album review became my most viewed album review video in my channel, which is absolutely fantastic. And then a little bit later, I found out that uh, Aoba Ichiko, one of my favorite, if not my favorite singer from Japan, has done a Reddit AMA, Ask Me Everything. And one of the questions being asked to her is, what is your favorite movie? And to that, she replied, all about Lili Shushu. And I was like, okay, okay, guys, okay. I want to watch this movie now. I have to watch this movie now. If this is Aoba Ichiko's favorite movie, like it's gotta be something special. And not too long ago, actually just earlier today, or I think last night, I just found out that Mitski had actually recently done a cover of a song, an insert song from this movie. So this is all the more reasons that I should check out this movie. So, All About Lily Shushu or Riri Shushu no Subete is a film about two teenagers in Japan, two boys. One is Yuichi, the main character, and the other is Hoshino. And together they are friends, but as they grow up, they grow apart. And through many incidents of betrayal and anger and via music and the internet, they connect, they uh, collide, there's conflict and there's romance, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of um, just terrible things happening. It is a dark film. It is uh, more so depressing than dark actually because this film explores uh, a, a part of teen life that I guess post 2000s or I guess post 1990s teen dramas begin to really dive deep on. Themes like bullying, and, 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 and rape and prostitution are being explored in this film. And um, before I get into the plot of this film, um, I'd like to talk about the technical aspects first. This film is gorgeous. I mean, I saw it in like 480p uh, with not so great sound quality, but I still really like it. The entire film is shot with a uh, digital camera and it's mostly handheld so it feels really natural it feels like a documentary there are a lot of jump cuts when it comes to the editing which makes it feel so much more natural and jumpy kind of like i'm watching the 400 blows or something and again it's very handheld and it has a lot of these wide angles with super deep depth of fields a la love and pop by Ano Hideaki who's actually a close friend of Iwai Shunji and i'll mention Ano Hideaki a little bit later in this review. You know I will. And to a certain degree, the cinematography of this film is also almost like Terrence Malick before the Terrence Malick we know and love today. Also, let's get the elephant out of the room here. The soundtrack is gorgeous. The soundtrack is half Didi Shushu and half Debussy. And De Debussy, uh, the pianist, the gorgeous, clean, beautiful, regal pianos in the soundtrack is amazing and dreamy. And then we have Riri Shushu, who is a fictional female musical artist in the film. And her music isn't super great or anything, but they certainly add onto the dreaminess and the surreality that the film is actually portraying. Now, I think this film is also a very niche film because it really caters towards late 1990s, early 2000s era teen culture in Japan. It's really, really specific to that culture. So um, even though I'm East Asian, it doesn't mean I'm able to relate to uh, many things in this film at all. And this film was also, I guess, a result of this 
uh, late 90s, early 2000s Japanese cultural movements, the rise of depressing teen dramas, and also internet horror films and animes. In terms of teen dramas that are super depressing, I mean, we have everything from Fooly Cooly, Evangelion by Ano Hideaki, the Monogatari series, Sankatsu no Rayon, Welcome to the NHK, Madoka Magica, friggin' Girls Last Tour, and films like Battle Royale and Suicide Club by Sion Sono, and also recently the anime Sonny Boy, which is just, oh my god, that anime just crushes my soul. And then when it comes to internet horror, turns out it's quite popular in the late 90s and early 2000s Japan. Internet horror includes the very famous Ringu, Kaido, as well as animes like Serial Experiments Lane. And um, I haven't watched that many teen drama movies and TV shows, but for the most part, I dislike a lot of them because I find a lot of them unrelatable. I find a lot of them just poorly written and fall into cliches and tropes and, and the same potholes again and again and again. You know, for instance, 13 Reasons Why and Riverdale and even shows that are more glamorous, that are more well-made like Euphoria. I also dislike it. I mean, don't get me wrong, Euphoria is enjoyable, but only a little bit. At the end of the day, I find nothing relatable or compelling about Euphoria. So it's almost like hopeless for me. It's almost hopeless for me to find a single good teen drama until I found out about animes. And certainly, I don't relate to anime, like especially high school teen animes, that completely, because again, there is a cultural difference nonetheless. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of anime, a lot of teen animes and high school animes also share similar themes that I have to deal with when I went through my teen life as well. So um, I've arrived at and I'm afraid this might be the best teen movie I've ever seen in my life. Maybe it is. I honestly don't even know. I mean, there are two ways to see it. Um, when I watched it last night, I honestly didn't know how to feel about this film after I finished it. I feel like this is exactly the kind of film that would leave me completely empty and destroy me emotionally. I mean, it has the right themes, the soundtrack, the cinematography, everything about this film would normally completely wreck me from top to bottom, psychologically. But it didn't exactly happen. I don't know why, maybe it's, it's because I wasn't in the right mood last night when I watched this film. Maybe it's because I have a really different mindset right now. Maybe. Three years ago, if I watched this film three years ago, maybe it would strike me way more. Or maybe it wouldn't because it has such an unconventional storytelling. And I don't know why, but this film is just not as hard-hitting to me as I would have liked it to. But that's not because the film is bad or anything. I think it's a me thing. But that being said, though, in comparison with other teen dramas or even other dramas in comparison. This is already more emotional, more psychological, and more hard-hitting than like 99% of the dramas I've ever watched in my life or, or 90%. Maybe 99 is a little ambitious. And there are two ways I could view this film. I could view this film and be like, okay, can I relate to this? Can I relate to this? How similar is my life than it is portrayed in this movie. And it is in movies like this where I ask questions like this way more. Like if I watch 13 Reasons Why, of course I'm not gonna be like, oh, can I relate to this? Can I relate to this? Because 13 Reasons Why is just so unrealistic. Like it's it's not even worth the effort to, to try to find anything relatable. But then we have this film and I'm gonna be honest here, once again, I cannot relate to it 100%. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, when I was a teenager, and that's like a year ago, um, I have, uh, out of my six close friends, two of them also cut their wrists. I, uh, I know that both of them have also attempted suicide, but uh, both of them had not succeeded, which is great. 
Um, I don't know a lot of bullying back at my secondary school, but um, maybe it's because my secondary school is just such a damn good school full of nice students. I mean, there are certainly mild forms of bullying, but like downright gang violence, forcing people to swim in the mud naked, forcing people to jerk off. Um, I don't think there is such thing in my secondary school. And then uh, there's uh, the sexual assault and rape and prostitution. I don't know any rapists from my school. I do know a couple sexual assault incidents, but none of them are this extreme. And I do know one person from my form who may or may not have prostituted themselves illegally. But um, certainly um, there's a kind of truth to this film that makes me relate to it, but also the bullying and the rape and the dark matters of this film is way more extreme than I, uh, than I have experienced myself, than I have seen and observed and I've heard myself during my teenage years in a secondary school in Hong Kong. And um, I don't know, but I feel like if I watch a film this way where I'm like, okay, I have to relate to this, like how different is my life and the life of these characters? Like, like, like what are the relatable stuff? I feel like I won't be able to enjoy the film as much as I, if I ignore these aspects. Like if I watch a film solely from a bird's eye view, like, I'm not connected to the characters at all, maybe I would be able to enjoy it more because, for instance, I could be watching a political thriller, like, um, for instance, um, Boat People. Like, I haven't been to communist Vietnam and I haven't been, like, downright being stalked by friggin' government officials, but I'm still able to be completely psychologically wrecked by the end of the film. So I feel like if I try to put aside my little nitpicks and comparisons between this film and my own teen life, I can still be able to enjoy this film on a very deep emotional level. I guess another thing I really love about this film and the story is how it um, explores the idea that music and internet are forms of escapism. Especially for music, because um, when I was a teenager, especially when I was in forms one, two, and three, I, um, it wasn't a great time. I didn't have a great time. I was uh, very lonely and sad. And uh, the, the band that got me through these times is Radiohead. Radiohead have, have embraced me. I have embraced Radiohead's music. And it's been pretty much what's holding my teenage life together. It's just a string of Radiohead songs. I mean, I remember crying to Street Spirits Fade Out um, in uh, February of 2016. Um, but I guess um, the difference here is that in this film, multiple characters really love the same artist. And I guess when I was a Radiohead fan, I don't know any other Radiohead fans ever. Like I don't know anything. And uh, another thing about this film is that it is internet in the late 90s and early 2000s and internet back then is still in its early stages and there is sort of a mystique around internet. Of course, the internet now is so much more of a safer space and so much more commercialized and so much more like user-friendly and global, but mid-2000s internet is like dark age. I mean, that is when the deepest, darkest, most disturbing shit from Reddit and 4chan surface. And people can remain anonymous back then. And we have these uh, like music log websites where people can just like chat room, you know, message board. And unfortunately, I'm born in 2002 and I wasn't able to go through this part of the internet. I wasn't able to experience this part of the internet. When I started using the internet, it's all air horns and Harlem shakes and Brazil World Cup. But um, still, there's a certain mystique around this and 
This film makes it so that these two things are forms of escapism. I mean, real life is cruel. Reality is depressing as hell. Nobody is happy in real life. And the only place where you can truly express your real identity and who you really are is on the internet. And it's sort of the idea that these characters are living double lives. And only in the internet, they can be true to themselves. They can express how much they want to kill themselves and how sad they are. But in real life, they have to keep a straight face. They have to shut up because of how uptight the society is and how much the society will judge you when you tell people that you're sad, especially when you're a boy, when people expect boys to be carefree, emotionless badasses. And another thing is uh, the depiction of loneliness. My personal favorite scene in this film is the kite scene where uh, Shiori Tsuda um, wanted to play some kites. And on the surface, it doesn't seem like much, but there's something about the scene that is so liberating in a sad, lifeless way. Like I've already given up on my own morals. I could just follow a bunch of kites and just play with it. And this is my life now. And there's just something so expressive and, 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 and naked about this. Like, like all your emotional barriers are just stripped naked. Um, I mean, there are a couple of moments in this film where I start to quiver. Like, oh, okay, hold on. Maybe this film is not as good as people say it is, okay? Maybe it's overrated. So um, a good chunk of this film in the first half is uh, the Okinawa bit where the uh, group of friends, uh, Hoshino, Yuichi, and a bunch of other boys basically travel to Okinawa. This is something that I cannot like relate to at all because um, as far uh, so far in my life, I've never met a group of friends and uh, went somewhere and just explore an adventure like that. I've never done that before, especially at such a young age. But this Okinawa bit felt really dragged on and there's nothing all that relatable or nothing all that compelling about this sequence. It doesn't serve the overall school drama theme of the story. But ultimately, this bit is also served like a dream sequence. It's like a, a, a collection of memories, especially given the fact that this sequence, these scenes are filmed with a handheld digital camera and uh, it's almost like found footage. And another part is where I'm beginning to think that, okay, they're saying, oh, Didi Shuju is this master artist. I mean, she's just so great, blah, 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 blah. Okay, I need to go actually. What if she's not even that good? Wouldn't that be embarrassing? So um, that is one of my concerns, but I think these are minor concerns. Um, the story is unconventional. In a way, it's almost like I'm watching a Wong Kar Wai film where the story plot points almost act as bits of memories that reflect a mood or a bigger truth. And uh, many other themes in this film, I think, are explored really well and also explored in the first place, like the unpredictability of teens. Um, again, I, I, I hate doing this, but I, I just automatically do this, is that I, I see people in the film and I think of my own life like the character of Hoshino who just change. And it's so unpredictable, but it happens. People just change like that. Teenagers, they just change. They just morph and you will never understand why. And even they themselves do not understand why. And I also really like um, the romance between Yuichi and Kuno because throughout the whole film, throughout the two and a half hours of the film, we never see Yuichi openly stalk Kuno or um, express his love or anything. But you can really feel the love because of these small scenes, these small little things like the eye contact or the way Kuno is being described in Yuichi's mouth or in other people's mouth. And um, um, again, this is like, um, it, it's very Japanese and it's very particularly late 90s and early 2000s. I mean, I even doubt that teenage culture in Japan nowadays in the 2010s and 2020s are that similar to this era of Japanese culture. And I guess with less prostitution, less depression, less nature, the internet being less scary, more cement and dust, more anxiety, more exam stress, and more politics, and voila, Hong Kong teenage culture of the 2010s. But um, 
I don't know, man. I have no idea. Um, it is definitely depressing. And this is exactly the kind of film that I would love and that I would rewatch again and again and again. Um, there's a certain part of my teen life, a certain a small part that I can still remember. It's almost nostalgic. Is um, the feeling of wanting to just go downstairs of your apartment and just scream on top of your lungs because you hate everything. You hate everyone, you hate everything, you hate your own life and you just want to die. And that angst, it's lost now. I don't have that angst anymore. I'm a grown ass man trying to make a living in the USA right now. But somewhere deep down, maybe I could still feel it. And maybe that small feeling will make me be able to resonate with this film a little bit more. But um, for now, um, this is definitely one of the most special films and I'll definitely be rewatching it soon. And um, I mean, I've talked too much. So um, I don't know, strong nine to a 10. So have you watched Riri Shuju no Subete by EY Shinji? From one to 10, how much you rate it, like or like it, and subscribe if you want more. And thanks for watching. <laughs>